You know, we're all going to meet in Founder's Court, where we will process through the Sally Port and meet by Willie's statue. And I thought, what? wait a minute. The president of the university should be saying, by the statue and tomb of our founder, William Marsh Rice. But no, it's just, we're going to meet at Willie's statue. And everyone goes, hmm, okay. And that was, that was very... Uh, that was a powerful way to let me know that we, we're not going to take ourselves seriously, so it's okay to, to push the boundaries and have a little bit of fun with what you do. And then I guess another one would be the, the first halftime show. Um, school started, and you know the mob doesn't get to start rehearsing during the summer like all the other college bands do. Uh, we start the first day of school, and we had you know three rehearsals and then a performance. And it was here at Rice Stadium, and it was against the University of Houston. And that had me pretty nervous. Uh, you know, I've taught, I had taught bands for 12 or 15 years before I got here, and never would I consider putting a show on with just three rehearsals, uh, especially in front of a huge crowd like that. I had some stress leading up to that, but the, the Rice students in the Rice community, but the Rice students in the band especially, were just so brilliant and so good at what they do uh, that everything, everything was just there, and everyone was mostly um, wondering why I would bother to stress about it, because this is obviously going to be so fine. Don't don't worry about anything. Uh, you said that you had uh, worked at, with other college bands or other university bands. Other bands, yeah. Um, where had that been? Well, as an undergraduate, you know, I, I was on the band staff, um, and that was at the University of Iowa. And then in graduate school, I, I essentially I worked my way through graduate school by uh, writing for the marching band at Stephen F. Austin State University. I was the graduate assistant with the band program, and you know got to conduct um, the the second concert band and and direct the basketball band, uh, but mostly was doing you know writing the the shows and some of the music for the for the marching band. And um, you still write a lot of uh, music for this marching band. I still arrange, well. yeah. We'll, we'll arrange a lot of tunes. Um, there, I, I have a list a mile long of projects I'd love to get to, uh, but though all those get pushed aside for whatever the next show idea was. Um, oh, this show idea was great, but we need this tune. All right, then we work on that. So I guess of that list, what's the song that you most want to hear the mob be able to play? I would. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm wondering how much to censor myself. Don't. Um, don't. I know that's what you want, but. <laughs> hey. The, the amount of, uh, I guess, Rice faculty who will be seeing well, this is minimal. That's that. That may be true, but you know, once it exists, it exists forever. Um, I would love to do uh, the theme from, uh, what is it, Team America World Police. Uh -oh. I would love to do that, just because it sounds so so energetic and everything. All these are ones that, one, if it sound, they all sound like, it sounds like movie theme music, but then when you know what it is, uh, it, it will give you pause. Um, that one, um, one that, no, we won't talk about that one. Oh. Nope. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, so just that one? All nope. Right. That's all we're gonna. That, that's all we'll be able to talk about. Pam, I plan know. for black man material has been. Ah, uh, no, no, there will be plenty more. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I guess you know we've sort of covered what you do for you know, fun mm -hmm. around campus, but right. uh, oh, I'd like to discuss you know where you actually get your large quantities of money. Huge amounts of money, yes. And, and that would probably yes. be, uh, I believe you are a bartender at Valhalla? Bartending at Valhalla. Now that's actually, that's my volunteer work. Because oh. it's important to give back to the community. And uh, Valhalla, I think, is a very important part of the Rice community. It's definitely important to me and my mental health. And so, uh, and I was surprised that uh, a lot of, you know, large corporations and universities and things will track the amount of volunteer hours that their, their employees do. And they use that for their PR here and there. And I'm just waiting for the opportunity to fill out a form with my regular volunteer hours as a volunteer bartender. But they, they're just not interested in knowing that, I guess. 
What do you want to know about bar bartending at Valhalla? Oh, um, mostly just, uh, you know, what's the sort of atmosphere? I mean, it's kind of a... Well, I have a lunch shift, so it's a little bit different uh, than when I'm just there to hang out. Um, the, and the lunch shift started out, it was just sort of this lazy hour and a half shift where, you know, you might sell 15 or 20 sandwiches and got to hang out with your friends. Um, but then as the years have gone by, and we've started offering more and more food and, and banh mi and all these kind of things that, that now it's, it's pretty busy. It's almost like work now. Um, but it's still the same kind of, the same kind of responsibility as a bartender is, is, you know, the fun, you get to pick the music. Um, but you need to, the fun of it for me is to take care of the people and to make sure that the, the atmosphere of the place uh, stays fun and lighthearted. That's why they have the no neckties rule there is there's enough uptightness in our world and even some creeps into rice every now and then so you can't wear a tie at Valhalla. Okay. And I, I have you know heard a couple of stories of the people at Valhalla. One I believe involved TV bowling. TV bowling yeah. Valhalla is this un, uneasy combination of a break-even business and a commune. And so there's sometimes there's some tension between the business side and the commune side. Um, the commune side was always just vehemently opposed to having televisions in the bar. The bar should be a place where we come together as a community and talk. And televisions make people stop and obey, obey the television, and you don't talk anymore. Um, and so to sort of prove their point um, and to have an excuse for a party, uh, once a year, they would gather up all the old televisions or at least abandoned televisions they could find around campus and around town and would then go bowling at the television screens. And, and you'd, you'd, you'd keep throwing the bowling ball until it broke through that one. And then you'd move that one and sweep up the shards of glass and then go for the next one. Um, maybe it was a, also a, uh, a sacrifice to the television gods so that they would stay away from Valhalla. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I guess a while ago you said that you, you know, liked, one of the things you liked about Valhalla was, you know, the ability to pick the music, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, as a band director, you know, what particular genres of music do you find most entertaining? Well, entertaining for me is different than what I would choose to make other yeah. people listen to. Um, well, let's do the first one. The first one, then... entertaining to me. Um, I really enjoy blues. I really enjoy, um, for short periods of time, uh, whatever the latest sort of craze is, I always want to check that out, but it's sort of a, uh, like a mechanic. I want to get under the hood and see how this, this craze works. Um, and then once I understand it, okay, that's fine. Now we can move on uh, to the next thing. So a lot of people in my position you know, talk very badly about popular music and, and how it's, you know, it's only this or it doesn't have that. Um, I just find it fascinating for whatever short amount of time it takes to figure out what's going on under there. Uh, symphonic work is amazing. There's so much power in, in what orchestras do. Um, I, I like the, the really, really weird contemporary squeaky, strange kind of stuff. I really do like that kind of music, especially um, if it's expressing something, not just being strange. Um, it, it does a couple of things. You know, it, it, it registers directly into the emotions rather than having, you know, here's a pretty melody that represents happiness or represents, usually contemporary music has more of the negative emotions, really. So here's a melody that represents fear. Uh, they just choose sounds that make you uneasy like you're experiencing that emotion. Uh, that's fascinating to me. And then the next time you hear something by Mozart, it's, it's like a new thing. You know, a major chord, oh, that's so wonderful now, because you sort of cleaned out your brain uh, with all those. What I want to have other people listen to, well, I, uh, I don't take them on very many journeys um, that far out there. But for my bartender shift, we'll either have, it'll either be a blues day, or it'll be, lately I've been doing uh, Pink Floyd, just doing Floyd Fridays. And so we'll do, do Pink Floyd music uh, during the bartender shift, or sometimes just pick a Pandora station that, 
that leans towards one of those. Um, the first nice weather day usually ends up being a ZZ Top, played a little bit too loud sort of time, though. All right. Well, I, for one, can't imagine why you wouldn't put, you know, the string straining melodious chords of <laughs> fear well, piping over Valhalla's... There are, well, mainly because there are other bartenders who do that. <laughs> Oh, uh, really? Yes, truly. There are other bartenders who have those on their playlists. Um, and the, the places really that, that I'm the only one that, do, that, that plays it are Blues and Pink Floyd at the moment. Okay. So th there's also a little bit of wanting to be special. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you talked sort of about the, the more artistic and uh, Does this also include the sort of, I guess, I'm not really sure what the term is. I believe it's sort of noise music that's all about building and sort of snowballing tension by playing as little notes as possible? For I haven't long. heard a lot of that. Okay. There, there was a time, I think, is, is, that, is that some of this music that K-True always got uh, uh, joked about for playing a lot of? Yes. Okay. I, didn't, I was never ever to hear a lot of that because you know, those, those shows were on when I was working. Uh, so I don't know enough about that. Um, but the, the parallel that I, I, I guess I could understand about sort of the electronic dance music thing that's going now and and that is fascinating that that it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and then there's this this silence and some little sound effect or a little clip from a movie or something and then it's just this amazingly powerful wall of sound and it's it's it just it's really visceral and it really uh, appeals to a very I think a very primitive part of my brain, and I I, I find it fascinating. I, I want to see how to how to understand that too, yeah. and uh, maybe mix some of that in someday. That would be kind of fun. I believe what you have just described is what the kids are calling fat beats dropping hard. Fat beats <laughs> dropping hard. Okay, I'll try to remember that. Is that fat with a ph? Yes. Okay, of course. Always. Always with a ph. That's what the kids these days are saying. Yes. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. All right. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to be talking about? I know we're currently in the Rice PR centennial sort of extravaganza. Centennial extravaganza. There's all sorts of centennial things going on. Um, one of the neatest things for me over the last couple of years has been uh, the Rice PR folks realizing that what the Rice bands do yeah, we might embarrass people every now and then, but we also bring a lot of good and positive attention to Rice. And uh, they've started including us in a lot of things. Okay. Uh, like what, for example? What we did um, when, when they kicked off the Centennial campaign, um, they had us come and make sort of a big splash and musical uh, rowdiness to make that a little more exciting. Um, we, when a Rice astronaut or a Rice alum who was an astronaut came back from the International Space Station, uh, they had us there to welcome her. Um, the first one was when uh, Anise Parker was elected mayor, another Rice alumna, and her first state of the city address, so her first kind of big speech she had to make was in uh, the, the Hilton Americas ballroom and filled with, you know, 1,400 businessmen in suits, and so we had the mob just sort of break in and, and shake up the beginning of that. Um, again, just sort of to bring out that, that rice fun into an event that usually wouldn't get to have it. Yeah, I guess one of the last questions, you know, going back to the very mm -hmm. beginning and the mob, um, a lot of the mob, you know, decorate their fedoras with different things. It's when true. Did that start from the very beginning when we became a scatter band, or...? I don't think it started at the beginning, because the uniform, I mean, when we started scattering, we still had a traditional uniform, which was really a bizarre look. Uh, and then after that, they went into a, um, they had some vests, they went into a sort of a faded denim looking shirt and vest and a little floppy hat. Um, the, the current style uniform didn't come in until the 80s when, uh, when Ken Dye was the director, and he sort of took the the theme from the Blues Brothers and also from sort of the the mafia mob sort of connection and so the pinstripe suits came in then 
I don't know when we started uh, decorating the fedoras. It was already happening when I got here. Um, but what I noticed is that uh, if I had invented it, I would be have, I would be a genius in in media um, manipulation because whenever anybody shoots a picture of of a band of a marching band especially is they'll always do a distant shot and be look they all look the same isn't that neat and it is neat uh, when they take shots of our band they go and here's the band and is that a chicken on that guy's head what wait what is that those are violins and it zooms in and it stays on the band because there's all this visual interest in what we do and so uh, I didn't invent the decorative fedoras but I wish I had because they're brilliant and, um, you know, finally, I guess the last sort of topic I would like to talk to you about is that you are um, actually one of the, you know, I guess handful of people I know who has, you know, taken up for a short period of time uh, brewing their own beer. Ah, yes. Um, I was just wondering, you know, how does one get into this? Does one just think, I really like beer, but I don't like paying for things? Not necessarily. Um... There's a certain amount of of the getting under the hood, you know. I, I, I like beer. There's so many different styles of beers and different flavors that they can have. It's not just the fizzy yellow stuff. Um, and once you start tasting those things, then the next curiosity is, well, I wonder how they did it. And so you get to try to make it and see. Um, that and there's also... A little bit rice is kind of the perfect place for this part of the curiosity is that when you start reading about how to homebrew beer you get a lot of completely contradictory information um, people will say you know this thing is very necessary and then people will say well no actually this thing is the thing that's necessary well what that means is there's not enough actual science going on and it's still kind of like alchemy um, and so Brewing beer around people at Rice is just great because you can brew something and say, here, taste this. I wonder what that is. And someone will say, oh, and take it back to their laboratory and find out exactly what it is. Hmm. And have you ever taken anyone up on this? Oh, yeah. The first, well, the first person I, I brewed, the first home brewing I did was actually done uh, on the lawn outside of the band hall. And uh, the person I was brewing with was uh, a Ph.D. student in biochemistry. So we, we were able to uh, we were able to access all of that knowledge. Okay, um, well, I believe this sort of you know wraps up the more tr you know casual interview part. But I would just like to uh, run you by a survey ah. we've sort of written up. Uh, the first part we're just going to ask you a couple questions. You just have to respond you know rather quickly, and we'll go down the list. <laughs> okay. Uh, when, we, when we get to the end, there'll be some parts where I will prompt you, and you will you know answer. Okay. Uh, or finish the statement, but, you know, I'll, again, tell you that when we get there. Okay. I must appreciate. Uh, I must you know, apologize if some of these you've already answered. It's okay. Yeah, you know, just for the record. For the record. All right. Uh, name? Chuck Throckmorton. Job? Director of bands. Sex? Male. Alma mater? University of Iowa and Stephen F. Austin State University. Favorite sport? Football. Favorite type of beer? Uh, a Belgian saison. Favorite animal? My dog. Favorite band? Mine. Favorite movie? It'd be a tie between Young Frankenstein and uh, The Princess Bride. Favorite food? All of it. Favorite village person? Favorite village person? Oh, wow. Uh, probably the leather enthusiast. Favorite clue murder weapon? Clue murder weapon would be the lead pipe. Favorite candidate for supreme ruler of Earth? Me. Favorite candidate for supreme person dumber than a ruler? <laughs> supreme person dumber than a ruler. So many choices. So many choices. So many choices. I'm going to have to say whoever is in charge of the, 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 the quote-unquote news that we get nowadays. 
Favorite member of the 1954 Arizona starting offensive lineup? <laughs> Your mom. <laughs> All right, now we've reached the part where I will say something, you will finish it. Okay. After I get up, the first thing I like to do is... Have coffee. On a Friday night, I like to... Have beer. Every year, I always look forward to... The start of school. My first job was at... Ooh, McDonald's. I could tell my boss one thing, I would say... Let's go faster. My strangest habit would have to be... <laughs> having long hair now. I don't think that dress like makes you look fat. I just think... <laughs> that you shouldn't wear it unless you're comfortable. I'm not saying that the Queen of England is an evil, shape-shifting reptile, but you have to admit... She does own nearly everything. I buried the body... <laughs> in a shallow grave by the railroad tracks. Alright. Thank you. This has been Chuck Throckmorton on RTV5.